Hi everyone and welcome to episode two of series four of Probably Nothing, the weekly online chat with the Eve Appeal. Uh, as you can see below, oh my god that feels so professional, uh, my name is Karen but I promise I'm a very nice Karen, I keep saying that, maybe one day it'll be true. I'm almost 31, I'm kind of coming to terms with that, you know, I'm called Karen Hobbs, you know, I can't do anything about it. Um, and I am the Cancer Information Officer at the Eve Appeal, and that basically means that I do a lot of the information and awareness stuff, and I run our Ask Eve information service along with our amazing gynae cancer nurse, Tracy. Um, so the service was set up a few years ago and we answer anyone and everyone's gynae, gynae health query. And we started Probably Nothing, this, this show, uh, last June for series one because we'd had a lot of people coming to us over the years you know saying hello ask Eve sorry to bother you first of all please never apologize that is quite literally what we're here for we want to hear from you uh, sorry to bother you um it's probably nothing but I'm worried about and most of the time uh, you know for, for all of the gynae cancer symptoms, it's always much more likely to be something less serious than cancer. Um, and, and it is probably nothing most of the time, which is great. But of course, um, for sometimes for some people, that, that probably nothing is something because 58 people are diagnosed every day in the UK with one of the five womb, ovarian, cervical, vulval or vaginal gynecological cancers. So we've created this space to um, have discussions. So each episode of the series has a different topic, there are different themes, and we start with kind of an opening issue, an opening question. I have an expert. You don't have to just listen to me for half an hour, don't worry. Uh, and we, yeah, we give as much information, answer common questions about said subject as we can, and hopefully make the, the topic and the information clear, accessible, easy to understand, um, and sometimes you might love because I am quite funny so you know like occasionally you'll have a giggle or two. So March is Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, last week we spoke to Adiola Olaitan uh, about the symptoms of ovarian cancer and this week we're going to be starting with the question I've just been diagnosed because our last episode with Adiola kind of took us up to the point of diagnosis. Um, I've just been diagnosed with ovarian cancer, what happens now? And I mentioned in my intro, which feels like it gets longer and longer every week, I do apologise. If you're watching this on catch up, feel free to, to skip ahead until you see someone else on the screen. Um, I mentioned that I run the Ask Eve service with an amazing gynae cancer nurse called Tracy. Lots of you will recognise her as I've dragged her onto this show many a time before in previous series. And she is my guest today to talk about ovarian cancer treatment and outlook. Please welcome Tracy. Hello, Karen. I'm feeling Aww. very welcome, very welcome, not dragged, really keen to help you, <laughs> help women find it's probably nothing. And it is, if it is something, as you said, the diagnosis of ovarian cancer, the what next? So I know what you've next? got some questions that have sort of come through themes from ladies that yeah. called in and the guys. So um, far away. OK, so Tracy, last week, as I said, we spoke to Adiola about all of the symptoms, all of the signs, um, kind of going to your GP, getting referred, having um, having a, having a CA125 blood test. So please watch the previous episode, everyone, if you want to kind of find out about that. Um, a scan, potentially taking the ovary out to diagnose. So look, if someone has gotten to that point and the results for their investigation come what happens from that point so I've just been told Karen the biopsy we've done shown that there's ovarian cancer what now okay so the fear factor comes in for any woman and her family that have heard that and so the what now is talking to that woman with her family or friend whoever she chooses to bring along with her about the treatment options that she's going to have in front of her and one of the first things that um, women often say is so am I going to have chemotherapy am I going to have surgery am I going to have radiotherapy mm. and um, and essentially um, they're quite right those are the three ways that we treat cancer. Can I just ask a quick question Tracy so yes. you know so so say um you've had the the a scan an ultrasound scan which we spoke yeah. about 
um, last week. And then um, Adiola said that often if there's something suspect either in the transvaginal or the abdominal ultrasound, that um, they will often remove the ovary rather than taking a piece of it. So if um, whether there's a piece or the whole thing taken out and, and it comes back with cancer, it sounds silly, but like, do you ever need to check again in those early stages that it definitely is rather than um, she spoke about an unusual atypical cyst, for example? Is it kind of very clear that it is cancer or before you tell the patient, do you ever need to sort of triple check or is it kind of very obvious? Let's go. I think you're training to be a gynae oncologist on the side, aren't you, Karen? Sneaky question. And you're absolutely I didn't spot want to talk on. About it. <laughs> We, we do we do need to check so as adiola has said you know the the blood tests the scan the imaging whether it's an ultrasound scan or a ct scan is super important but before we do anything big like surgery or chemotherapy and i'll explain why not radiotherapy shortly then we absolutely do need to see something under the microscope we would prefer to see a biopsy that's a piece of tissue as opposed to cytology that's sometimes the fluid that is developed, um, which causes the bloating that women feel. So you're absolutely right. We don't start anything without something we, we will say collectively from the microscope doctors. So we absolutely have to have that. Um, so we do need that confirmation. And would somebody have um, an MRI scan? I think lots of people watching this will know what an MRI scan is. They'll have seen, you know, the big machines, either they've had one themselves or on TV. Um, is that part of the process or would they have had that earlier in their investigation or do they have that later to check on the cancer treatment like when does the mri scan come into play so in fact usually the scan is going to be a ct scan in this situation okay. so she will have the transvaginal or the ultrasound scan that's usually the first scan that she'll have the second scan will be the ct scan and will either be a, a simple ct scan in other words not with a biopsy a lot with it or she will have a CT guided biopsy. MRI is, is a scanning um, way, way that we scan people, but actually it's not what we tend to use in ovarian cancer. So it's a CT scan. What is the difference? So I hate to talk about myself, um, but cervical cancer stuff, I've always had in diagnosis picture together in checkups, it's always been MRI. Why, if I had ovary, would I have a CT or MRI? And what is the difference? Okay, so it's simply different ways of almost looking through different lenses. So they, okay. so they show uh, the you on the inside out, um, and the MRI, that's a magnetic resonance scan, is different to a CT, which is commute, computerized axial tomography, which is just me showing off what I know they mean. Essentially, what it does mean is we see, we, we just see it seeing you on from the inside in different angles. And in ovary cancer, the CT image is usually all we need plus the ultrasound. Whereas in cervix cancer, which is what you had and don't have any more, thank heavens, I couldn't work without you. I couldn't um, have any, I couldn't, I couldn't, no one would want to put up with me if I wanted that much more attention, would they? <laughs> it'd, be a night, it'd be a nightmare for everyone if anything bad happened to me again. Uh, I tell you, I tell you, it really would. So in oh, cervix oh. cancer, it's often a combination of CT and MRI. So it's, it's just different, it's different because it's a different, although it's gynecological cancer, it's a different one. So different she will need to have, she will, she's almost like definitely going to have a CT scan before she starts any treatment, because what we want to do is compare the before and after treatment. And the treatment is likely to be, so we need a, a snapshot of what she looks like on the inside mm. before she starts a treatment so that we can compare it after treatment. And the two treatments that she's likely to have are, chemotherapy and surgery and likely to be a combination of both radiotherapy is something we don't use very very rarely use now in in ovarian cancer so say okay so say from the um scans you've seen okay Karen does have ovarian cancer can you see from without going properly in for surgery can you see from the imaging um like could you clearly see how much ovarian cancer I've got because because 
oh, cancer's in stages, isn't it? So stage one is the least amount of cancer. Stage four, stage two, three, four, more and more. It means it's spread basically. Uh, the higher up the number you go, the more, yes. the more, se the more serious, the more extensive the treatment. The really sadly, kind of like the less likely that a full recovery will be made. The higher up you go. Can you tell from these scans that you're just talking about? if what number I am basically pretty much yes um the definitive of course is always as you say it's the it's once the surgeon has done the surgery and then whatever's removed at surgery is seen under the microscope so the absolute final definitive is when we have the microscope test done on whatever's removed but yeah we can we can generally give a very good if I say guesstimate that doesn't sound scientific enough we've got a very good idea of what stage this patient is at and generally, she's going to be about a stage three because that's generally because of the symptoms that Adiola was, was talking about mm. last week because they're so nonspecific um, mm. and often don't present it. So it's generally about a stage three. OK, so say, OK, so you've got me. I've been scanned. You've seen let's go with the sort of typical picture. Uh, you've seen that I've got you think probably stage three. Um, I've been told the news at this point. Have I? Yes. All I'd be told, yes, I have. And then what happens? So I'm sat down with my friend. You told me it looks likely that this is a stage three ovarian cancer. What do we do now? So then we tell you we're going to look after you and we're going to treat you. Mm. So we're going to treat you. We're going to offer you treatment at whatever stage you are. And that's really, really important. The type of treatment um, depends on stage um and on your uh age but not being ageist as in if you're an older lady or a younger lady we're not going to treat you it's the comorbid morbidities the other things wrong with you that will affect what treatment we can give you the important mm. thing is we're going to offer you something mm. the majority of women irrespective of age if they are at a stage two and, and upwards it's very rarely that we don't do any chemotherapy at all mm. it's only in mm. some of the early stage ones that we we monitor and keep an eye on so that so generally for the majority of women we're going to offer chemotherapy we would like to generally offer chemotherapy first and generally we give about six doses of chemotherapy i can explain that more in a minute just want to give you an overview um, and then we'll also complement the chemotherapy with some surgery. The surgery we tend to do in the middle of the chemo. So we'll do three cycles or doses. It means the same thing. Three cycles or doses of chemo. Then we'll mm. do the surgery um, mm. to remove whatever has got cancer on it. And the surgeon can see that when they do the operation. And then we'll mop up, if you like, the rest of, the, of, of anything that the surgeon can't remove with chemotherapy. Does that make sense? And it does. And so, OK, so it's most likely, again, never, nothing is ever 100 percent, but it is most likely if you have ovarian cancer, you will almost certainly have chemo because of the stage you are almost certainly going to be a two, three or four. And um, so Adiola was saying last week that um, obviously it's rare to be diagnosed with stage one ovarian cancer um, and it's often kind of luck that that gets found due to other issues and then it's like oh gosh there is an early ovarian cancer here so in if on the sort of off chance it's found early um it is then for stage one a case of whipping out the ovary and then monitoring but then two or above is chemo is that right yeah 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 and this is all the generalization because there are but you, generally that's the picture so for every every woman every any cancer patient woman or man but we're talking about eve here mm -hmm. um um every case goes through the multidisciplinary team meeting so where we then look at the general way we do things and then it's bespoke the treatment that we match to the patient but that is generally what happens absolutely and is an mdt like basically everyone that could be involved in my cancer journey medically in a room talking about me is that what it yes. is yeah we're all there well in fact we're on teams at the moment because we can't be in the room because mm. there's a virus called covid you may have heard of it it's been going on for a while that? what's that Tracy? Yeah. Well, it means everybody has to talk to each other on telly and I've just got the hang of it, which is why I'm chatting to you, which is great. Um, so, yes, your whole the whole team is there 
um, minus the patient. This is where the patient doesn't mm. have to be at that meeting. And it's a scientific meeting. We report back to her and tell her what, what, what we've talked about. But we'll look at microscope tests. We'll look at blood tests. We'll look at imaging tests. And we'll work out the best way to manage this lady's case. Um, here's, here's a quick question about those meetings, because I've been asked this before. Yeah. So the, obviously, this is the point where the patient isn't there because it is the healthcare professionals talking about how to sort Karen's ovarian cancer out. Is there such a thing as a patient representative? What What if I'm not saying that I that is not the case, but, you know, I like to play devil's advocate. And because we're best friends, I can push you as a guest a bit more. What if I have heard what if? OK, what if my point to diagnosis like I spoke about with the adiola, was all over the shop, was going to gastro, back to the GP, blah, 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 ends up in A&E. I've lost all faith in you as my healthcare team because of how damn long it took you to find my cancer. Not blame, not, tra not Tracy, Tracy's amazing. Um, so I've got told I've got stage three or four ovarian cancer, right? Well, it took me a year to get diagnosed. Can I, is there anything where like I can be represented in the meetings as the patient or is that a stupid question? No, it's a really good question because that's me. So you should have a cancer nurse specialist designated to your case. Everybody with cancer, man, woman or child, um, should have a cancer nurse specialist. Doesn't mean that they're going to be there at every single meeting, at every single chemo or during the surgery, but it does mean that they should be there to be sort of like a key worker, to be their advocate. So absolutely. Yeah. So let's say in this situation, there was this young woman called Karen who'd been diagnosed with a cancer and mm. she felt that she really hadn't been well supported or felt mm. let down. And that's not uncommon. Mm. It's all frightening. Then actually her, her nurse advocate, me in this case, would be going... The other thing we have to factor in is is Karen doesn't have any faith in what's in what's happening at the moment, so we yeah, need to be yeah. honest. That they're really, really important. So I am the patient's mm. voice. Okay, so a CNS, yeah. um, a cancer nurse specialist, yeah, is given to a cancer patient. Essentially. Exactly. Exactly. Fine. Fine. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Um, is it is it cancer nurse specialist or clinical nurse specialist, Tracy? It's both. Um, of course, the NHS does everything in code and then can't work out how to use its own yeah. code. Um, that's a bit flippant. Because I've the heard NHS you call person. I've heard you call cancer nurse specialist and you've been called clinical nurse specialist. I'm a sort of a CCNS, a cancer yeah. clinical nurse yeah. specialist, but it's a bit sort of Tourette. So they've it's whatever you feel like on the day. Um, okay, so both. CNS, fine. So you've discussed in the meeting a stage a stage three ovarian cancer now can you speak a bit more about you mentioned chemo yeah. um and then surgery then chemo now is that unusual to have chemo surgery chemo isn't it normally uh let's whip it out then give some chemo if we need why have you gone chemo first so it used to be let's whip it out and give the chemo Mm. Um, because we know that actually you need to do, for the majority of cases, you need to do both things. The, the, the surgery will debulk, and that's actually the name of the operation, will get rid of the bulk of the, of the tumour, the cancer. And the chemo is cytotoxic. It will, it will kill the microscopic stuff that's left or that was there to, to begin with, depending on what order you do it in. So we used mm. to uh, do the debulking surgery up front, first thing, and then follow on with the six doses of chemo. Then there were two big trials that looked to see, well, what about if you got rid of it, some of it with chemo first, then mm. did some surgery and then finished mm. off with chemo. We did that and trials worldwide have showed that's generally the best way to do it. So I've got a really odd analogy, but I like to, I think it's hard. I don't have, I mean, despite how I come across, I don't have a medical sort of logical brain. So if anyone's like me to kind of understand it, is this fair to say, say you've got a jacket potato yeah. and you put loads of butter on the jacket potato, yeah. Yeah. it's going to like soak onto the pele as well. It's going to be a, right. So first of all, you mop up some of the butter from the jacket potato yeah. Then you take the jacket potato off of the plate. Yeah. Then you go back with your paper towel and mop up any remaining butter left behind once you took the potato off. Apart from being very hungry now, Karen, um, <laughs> you've given me a new way of describing. Yes, absolutely. 
<laughs> I'm so hungry. Do you know why I thought of that? It's because I've got my eye on a big old sweet potato in the kitchen. That's why. <laughs> But yeah, no, you're so absolutely hungry. right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. That, and and so it is. And 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 essentially, that's why we need scans at the beginning and after surgery and at the end to see how well the treatment is working. And that is predominantly why we do it in in that in that fashion. Sometimes we find though with some of the ovarian type of cancers because if um if any of our I was going to say readers watchers is that the right word for people people audience. watching this video audience audience, audience. Um, yeah. yeah. Do have a look at our website because that will give lots more information about ovarian cancer, where we describe it as ovarian fallopian tube and primary peritoneal cancer. So it's all under the same umbrella. It's all the same sort of change of the cells. Um, mm. And for some of the ovarian type of cancers, actually, there's not much bulk or not many lumps. There's not a lot of tumour there. So, in mm. fact, there isn't much to operate on. So there's not much potato, using your analogy. Yes. There's yes. more butter, butter floating around Fine. inside to get rid of. So mm. sometimes, in some cases, it will, when I say just, because I don't want to belittle what a no, woman goes through having chemo, yeah. Um, yeah. it may be that chemotherapy is, is actually the treatment of choice and that surgery is not necessarily uh, needed. That's not that common, but but that can be the case. And you mentioned different types of ovarian cancer. Obviously, we can't go into like the minutiae of all the different types now. But um, you did say some types are less potato or more butter. Mm -hmm. Are those types more serious, more like progress quicker, more, yeah, kind of more concerning? Or is it just... It's just a different type. It has a different treatment. Or is there a correlation between potato, butter and severity? Um, or is it silly because it's ovarian cancer? Of course, it's serious. It's cancer. Um, yeah, it is very serious. It's cancer. You're right. Um, so it's not necessarily the how it presents as in as in lots of potato lumps and butter. Yeah, Honestly, yeah. if people are watching this, they're going to think we're on a cooking program. I know, aren't they? Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's more actually what the cells look like under the microscope. So they are they are categorized um, differently under the microscope. So, for example, um, the predominantly it's there's a it's called serous, not serious, but serous papillary. That's about 80 percent of cancers, uh, ovarian okay. cancers. And those are ones that where and I know you're going to get um, Adam to talk a lot more about the um, BRCA gene. Those are ones yes. where women yeah, yeah, who yeah. carry an altered BRCA gene have that. And so that's another thing that you'll be offered in as you as you go into treatment is to have a, a genetic test. But Adam will fill you in all, all about that Next when you talk to him. Episode. Exactly. Super, yeah. super. So um, those. It, so it's more the change of the cell. Some of the cell, there's, there's another one called clear cell. There's another called hypercalcemic um, um, ovarian cancer. And that's really, really rare. And in fact, the, the Eva Peel support research in that. Um, the Butcher family have helped us with that. You'll oh, know yes. all about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but the majority of the cancers are high grade serous, not serious. Um, and so that those. That's the most, that's the most, if, again, cause we're, if we're talking about like a typical ovarian cancer picture. Yeah. So we often do this. So I don't want anyone watching thinking, oh, I don't fit into that typical. It doesn't mean your you or your abnormal it's just sometimes it's easier to sort of generalize yeah. the majority so is the yeah. is it most likely hello i've got ovarian cancer is it would you put a pound on it being high grade serous yeah 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 about 80 percent of them absolutely okay. well, i say yeah. that's that's a, that's actually a big majority of this it's one it's, type it is it is and and the majority of patients will have a combination as we said of surgery and chemotherapy usually with the surgery in the middle of the chemotherapy um, unless as we were saying there's there, there isn't very much potato not much lump there if you like using that analogy um, mm. and, and therefore chemo does the job or sometimes we will go with what's called upfront surgery surgery first if the lumpy area the potato again is actually mm. pressing on um, organs like the bowel and stopping mm. it working so if she presents she's going to be a grade uh, a stage three at this point stage three at this point um and if she's yeah, in and a lot it, of and is this with 
would this kind of line up with um, the patient feeling like having constipation or diarrhea, toilet, tummy bloating? Is that because it's kind of pushing on the bowel that it, that's the organ that, you know, helps you poo? So if you're having yeah. poo problems, it's likely it's because it's pushing on the bowel. Yeah, yeah. And if it's affecting that. Now, usually we can start with the chemo and still manage that. There are occasions, though, when the, the, there is so much pushing or pressure on the bowel that actually surgery is the thing that is needed to alleviate that situation, to stop the bowel being completely obstructed, which is the word we use, because then mm. she's in trouble. We need our bowel not to be obstructed. We need it to work. So mm. those are the cases when we're likely to go with surgery first. Surgery first. And you said, like, in a sort of common picture it going chemo surgery chemo yeah. um you said uh it's often six rounds of chemo with surgery in the middle so three yeah. op three if it is there a correlation between um so say i was stage two would i have fewer cycles of chemo at the beginning before surgery and if i was stage four would i have like nine at the beginning before surgery or is it always three if you're doing the three op three plan i love your questions you make my life so easy because it's just like sense. so the way it goes is so yeah why not use nine cycles why use six why not use five why not use four and the reason that we generally use six general is because of research so the eve appeal is mm. all about research this is mm. not the research that we but 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 research gives us a definitive way the more thing the more things you try or the more people you try things on the, the better your data your answers so the reason why we generally use six cycles in total mm. whether it's with chemo in the mod, middle at, at the end or the beginning is because research has shown that actually six is the most effective you give less than six not so much effect on getting rid of the cancer you give more mm. than six you're actually not going to gain any benefit but just the toxicity which is the medical jargon for side effects of chemo so mm. six is generally the golden rule and you said um side effects so yeah. i think a lot of people when they hear the word cancer and chemo will immediately think hair loss is that common is there different types of chemo that mean oh if we give karen that she'll definitely lose her hair but she really doesn't want to uh so let's try her on this or is it just tough you're going to lose it so chemo is tough full stop i agree with you um the the drug of choice that we use for pretty every much every single patient and you there's no hair left hair loss is called carboplatin it's basically platinum salts ground up and, and delivered in in a in a in a drip. You've seen it in the, in the films. Mm. You've had drips yourself mm. when you had your treatment, Karen. Um, and there's no hair loss with that. And actually, okay. it's not that it's not that sick making or emetic potential. So that's a good mm. thing. But it's exquisitely sensitive to ovarian cancer. It is generally accepted that for most patients, if possible, we then add in a second agent, second drug. And generally, that's a drug called Paclitaxel. That one does cause hair loss, albeit temporary, it does cause hair loss. It can also um, affect the uh, fingers and toes, a thing called peripheral neuropathy. Yes. Yes. Like yeah. mm. um, so the oncologist, that's the chemotherapy doctor, will talk about that um, with the patient on an individual basis, the pros and cons of adding in the second drug. Um, we've got much better at managing hair loss these days. You may have seen or heard of um, a thing called a cold cap, which mm. is essentially, it is literally a cold cap that a patient wears while she's having her chemotherapy. And that we've freezes tried, the... We tried we did. one, didn't we? Do you remember? We did. Yeah, we went to, we went to the um, wonderful uh, gyne lot of guys. Um, this was ages ago now, wasn't it? Yeah. Like a good few years ago, uh, I spoke to their lovely gynae team, and we got to try a cold cap, and it's like a it's like a freezing cold swimming cap. That's the easiest yeah. way to explain, it, I think, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And the idea behind that is that you wear that whilst you're having the chemotherapy, that freezes or or takes the hair follicles down to such a cold that the the blood doesn't get to the hair follicles whilst it's got the the platinum whilst it's got the taxol in it, the drug. And therefore, that should reduce hair loss. It can be quite effective. It's tough to do, though. I remember I pulled the cap off. You managed to keep it on, Karen. And that was only for a minute. Um, yeah, but only because I wanted to beat you. <laughs> <laughs> it was horrible. I just wanted to win. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Trace, so 
so se so most ovarian cancers are diagnosed in people who are post menopause so sort of late 50s 60s 70s upwards yeah. obviously a, a smaller but not a non-existent percentage are um pre-menopausal so still menstruating aka still fertile if people want to have babies this is probably a whole other topic but we won't go into kind of like full-on fertility stuff because that's you know it's that's sort of a separate thing but if because i'm 30 and i don't have children yet and might want to would you would would just to touch on it would the egg freezing if there was time would that come before the first cycle of chemo would that be kind of like one of the first things to happen it if would i need wanted to it yeah, it would need to come before the first cycle of chemo because chemo is cytotoxic. That means it, it kills quickly dividing cells. Um, there's a whole um, section in uh, Young Woman's Guide to Cancer that we've contributed to mm. with um, the other uh, with the ovarian cancer charities, um, mm. which we've got on our website. Um, it's not always as simple as that, though, because um, we are usually keen to get on and treat women and then it's a toss up between whether or not we look at egg harvesting or whether or not we crack on with the chemotherapy. A really, really difficult choice for young women to make. But that's the principle. Crack on. Don't even go know, there, Karen. I know. I know. <laughs> I'm so sorry. And I know it is an incredibly, incredibly sensitive and serious subject. But when we were talking about eggs and you said we want to crack on, I thought, I'm cracking up. How got, well do yeah. I know you that that's what I know. Went through in you can mind. see it. In, you can see it yeah. in my eyes, can you? I just like, yeah. um, I don't want anyone watching to think we are at all making light of it. But Tracy saying crack on when it comes to eggs, that is funny. You have to laugh at that stuff. Oh my goodness. Um, okay, so if possible, it would be egg freezing first. Sometimes that's not possible. So it would be key typically, again, as you said, MDT is kind of tailored and they'll kind of personalise and individualise your treatment. But typically it would be um, chemo, surgery, chemo. Yeah. Now, um, we're running out of time. So just to sort of, it's quite, this is a heavier, it's a heavier sort of topic than kind of, you know, signs and symptoms, isn't it? Because it means yeah. the poor person's got it. But, but once the chemo, surgery, chemo is done for a typical ovarian picture and if we're doing typical the person's probably in their 60s or so so yeah. that's not just about the egg freezing for now um is it likely in your experience i know this is a really loaded question but is it likely that chemo surgery chemo with ovarian cancer will do the job or would you really unfortunately expect to see patient again okay so and I, I know think that's a horrible thing to ask you and a horrible weird note to end on but like just yeah to sort of that's the sort of treatment that's the process is that often enough so we will see the patient again because we'll see her in follow-up yes and of course. usually for the majority we've got much much better for the majority of patients the outcome um is much better than it used to be even five mm. years ago mm. so um it's all down to how well the chemotherapy has worked and we mm. won't know. So we need to keep an eye on this patient and we'll see her every three months. Usually it will work for a period of time. Mm. But yes, Karen, the, 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 hidden answer, the hidden question, actually it's not a hidden question, is is it likely to come <laughs> back? That's it, it probably will. Sorry, the cat. This is so. This is like the worst moment for the cat to turn up when we're talking about recurrent. Come here. Um. Okay. So, ovarian cancer. We, you know, because is and is that because? So you said you're. You won't be surprised if you see her again. Uh, apart, you know, for treatment, obviously follow up. You see her. Is that because? Of, is that is that specific to ovarian cancer that you would wouldn't be surprised if you saw her again for a recurrence is that specific to ovarian cancer or is that specific to later stage diagnosis cancers like if i'd had a stage, i was really lucky i had a late stage one cervical cancer but if i'd been diagnosed at a stage three cervical cancer 
would you be saying the same thing? Is it stage or is it uh, organ? Actually, it's both because ovarian cancer tends to be found at a later stage, as we were saying, yeah. sort of at yeah. the, the, the top of the show, at, at, at stage three. So although surgery and chemotherapy can be incredibly effective at giving a, a, a length of better quality life and good outcomes, mm. it is likely that there will be one or two cells left when it's that later stage, which is when we tend to find it, that it will reoccur in years to come. But it could be years away before it reoccurs. So you said that's because there's, there's likely to not unlikely let's rather let's say not unlikely rather than likely to try and make it let's get it's not unlikely that there'll be a recurrence and because of the couple of bits left over sort of thing can i not like why can't you just when you're doing the mopping up after surgery i want to say to you well why would you leave a couple of bits why can't you just make sure you get all of the butter why would you leave a speck of butter on the plate tracy like come on so the idea is, is that we don't leave anything. The surgery is optimal debulking. They take away everything that they can see. That's macroscopically what the surgeon's eyes can see. And we hope that the chemotherapy gets rid of everything microscopically. So every single cell that is left floating around inside the patient in the peritoneal cavity. So that's the bit from sort of the rib cage down into the pelvis, which is where this cancer predominantly grows mm. that, the, that the chemotherapy has got rid of every single cell every microscopic cell so the surgeons can get rid of it all macroscopically there might be one microscopic cell left that the chemotherapy hasn't been effective on and that's why it can then start to grow again but okay. it has but to it's not, start it's from, not because it's not because because i can imagine people would say well you know it's because they've not done the job properly mm -hmm. it's 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 nothing I would I would say I don't I'm 30 I don't want a recurrence so do your do your job properly so I don't yeah. get it again but it's it's not something it's so so microscopic it's not something that it can't be helped sort of thing exactly we use a term called chemosensitivity how sensitive is the are these microscopic cancer cells to the chemotherapy and yeah. if 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 every single cell hasn't been killed off, then there's a potential it could start to grow again. But that doesn't mean we're not going to treat this patient again. If it yeah. starts to grow again, it starts from um, what we call zero residuum because we've got rid of everything that we could see. Yeah, so it's not like there's all the old ovarian cancer that exactly. stayed there for years and this these extra bits. It's only the it's only the little bit of butter the potato is still and the yeah. main bit of butter is still disappeared from when you got rid yeah. of it ages ago yeah. yeah yeah okay so it's kind exactly. of like if there's a recurrence think of it as sort of starting again rather exactly. than building on what was already there exactly and we've got so many more different therapies not just um not just the the chemotherapy there are other drugs called maintenance treatment which adam will talk about next week mm. um which are allied to to the to the genetic status so there's lots more that we can treat if it comes back okay um we're out of time tracy so can you just say sort of one last thing from a ccns uh perspective so if someone has just been diagnosed with ovarian cancer just like a couple of little things you would say to them okay so we understand that the woman and her family are always super scared and super frightened and the, the thing is is just to ask questions write down your questions ask for information links whether it's online whether it's um in an information book everybody likes to do information differently and don't feel that you can't keep asking and questioning mm. and no question is silly um and no question can't be asked more than once that's what we're here for to help with the fear factor thank you tracy okay We've got lovely. Another, tracy. love you lots thank you so much see you. see you in a minute bye oh i love her so much and um if you could see a pair of ears while i was talking it's because arthur my cat came to see everyone hello 
Hello, Arthur. Um, thank you, everybody, so much for tuning in to episode two of series four of Probably Nothing about ovarian cancer treatments. So you've just been diagnosed with ovarian cancer. What happens now? So next week, I'll be joined by Dr. Adam Rosenthal, one of our amazing um, researchers at Eve Appeal, and he's also um, a, an oncologist, uh, of course. Of course, he is. That's why I'm going to be talking to him, um, a gynecologist. oncologist. So we're going to be talking about BRCA, which is the genetic alteration that means someone is at a higher risk of ovarian and breast cancer. So we're going to be talking all about BRCA next week. If you have a question that you would like me to ask Adam during that episode, please email um, probably nothing at eveappeal.org.uk. But if you've got any questions ever that you want to talk to Tracy or I about, um, our Ask Eve details are nurse at eveappeal.org.uk. So thank you again so much for watching. Um, stay safe and see you next week. Bye.